All right, everyone, welcome to this year's uh, transportation management seminar. My name is Olivia and I'm a senior program manager here at Commute Seattle. Uh, we have a great team of specialists that are available for free support and um, it's great to have you here. So thanks for joining. Um, and then we have five really great speakers, including myself here today with you all to talk with you. We have Matthew Combe from the District 2030. Um, he's the executive director there and have been there for about nine years. Um, he's a really great and trusted spokesperson for the business community in terms of reducing carbon emissions for us and, and is really setting us on the path to achieving some great goals. Uh, we have myself, Olivia, here um, with Commute Seattle Senior Program Manager, primarily working on the commute trip reduction and transportation management programs. We also have Ben Rosenblatt with the City of Seattle. He's a senior planner working on the transportation management plan and also on the um, micro mobility team as well. We have Jim Long here with Urban Renaissance Group um, with the Columbia Center. And then we have Sabrina Villanueva with Kleist Properties as well. Matthew, I'm gonna hand things over to you now. Thanks, Olivia. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you again to, to Olivia for inviting uh, the Seattle 2030 district to this or kind of partnering with us, I guess, uh, on this session. Um, and thank you to the rest of the speakers. I think uh, this should be a really interesting uh, panel discussion um, and hopefully have some good information in here. So I'm just gonna give a little bit of information about the Seattle 2030 district and also kind of set the stage on why transportation is such an important issue here in Seattle. Uh, so like Olivia said, I'm with the Seattle 2030 district and we are a uh, business model for urban sustainability uh, through collaboration, leverage financing, and shared resources here in Seattle. The main aim here is to kind of break down market barriers to building efficiency. And we are a private public partnership. And the main reason that I say that we're private sector led is because we've seen uh, public sector programs lag or even fail in the past. Uh, and that can happen for a variety of reasons. Uh, but the big one is just when there's a change in administration. So what the Seattle 2030 district allows uh, the city of Seattle to do is kind of let private industry set the initiatives um, and kind of set what that looks like over the next several years and then have the public sector support that with their policies. So we have a shared mission and goal, which is important, uh, really when we're trying to make such a large change uh, on this kind of scale, uh, because if you don't set a goal, then A, you're never gonna achieve it, um, and then B, you can't manage what you don't measure. And the time frame here is important. So the year 2030 is not very far away. Uh, Olivia kind of alluded to the fact that I've been here for nine years. We also have, I think it's about nine years and 25 days uh, until 2030 comes. So it's not very far away, but at the same time, we still feel like these goals are achievable. Uh, we'll also be around for that period of time, at least I hope so. Um, and for many of you, you'll also, uh, you might own an asset for that period of time as well. So we know that globally, we need to achieve these carbon neutral buildings uh, and high performing buildings by the year 2030, according to climate scientists. Uh, we kind of know that going into this. So what is the goal of the 2030 district? So the goal is to achieve a 50% reduction in energy, water and transportation by the year 2030 with interim goals leading up to that. And then the goal for new construction is a little bit different. Um, for new construction and major renovations, we're looking to get to a carbon neutral building by the year 2030. The interim goal is an 80% reduction in energy use. Uh, that's about 25% better than the current energy code here in Seattle. Uh, of course, that's being updated fairly shortly, so that number will change a little bit. Um, but the number that uh, I kind of want to concentrate here on today is the transportation side of things. I'll touch on why transportation is important, but that 50% reduction in transportation emissions is really key here in Seattle. 
Um, so where are we based? So the Seattle 2030 district is, is based in downtown Seattle. Uh, we kind of stretch from kind of the Starbucks Center up to Lake Union and from the waterfront to Capitol Hill and Forest Hill. Um, we have about 260 member buildings committed and that's about 60 million square feet. Um, and I mentioned the shared mission of the district earlier. Um, the reason why so many building owners like the 2030 district goals or the model is because the goal isn't an individual goal as a building owner, it's a collective goal. So when you commit to achieving the goal, you might be able to go above that 50% goal as, as a building owner, uh, especially if you're a newer building. But if you're an older building, you might only be able to achieve a 30% reduction. But on average, then that, that the district is going to achieve that 50% goal, which puts us on that path to climate stabilization. So what exactly does the 2030 district do for its members? Well, we try and convene our business leaders uh, and government officials to really create policies and incentives that work for both parties and get us to the goals of the 2030 district. We provide education sessions, much like this one, where we partner with uh, some other organizations and our members to really highlight new strategies uh, that will help uh, buildings uh, achieve the goals. Most recently, uh, we have been concentrating on how to reopen buildings with occupant health in mind while also improving building efficiencies. Uh, we also provide demonstration projects with new technologies uh, with our members to bring products to market quicker. Uh, a good example of that is the EV charging stations, kind of relating that to transportation. Uh, we did a lot of work in, early, in the early days of EVs to kind of accelerate EV charging stations in buildings. Uh, we advocate for new policies and incentives that kind of goes with the convening side of things. And then we facilitate conversations amongst our building owners to share the information um, that building owners have. One thing that members agreed on when the district started is that they compete on everything in their buildings, uh, but they don't really need to compete on climate change. Uh, and we provide a space for them to really share that knowledge on how they're achieving their goals. And then lastly, we celebrate our members' achievements. Um, we provide case studies uh, on our website and then at our annual vision awards, we celebrate our members. We give four awards um, to members who have showcased exemplary buildings in energy, water, transportation, and overall leadership. And today we're actually joined by the winner of this year's transportation award, um, the Columbia Center with Jim Long. So I mentioned this, I was, so I was wrong earlier, nine years and 21 days is what we have uh, left to achieve the 2030 district goals. And the IPCC report really shows that we need to get to zero emissions by the year 2030, 2050, sorry. And to do that, it's essential that we achieve that 50% reduction by 2030. It, um, and that's nine years and 21 days. So the longer we take to reduce those emissions, the more severe those annual reductions become to get to that 2050 goal. And that gives us a 50% chance of achieving that one and a half degree temperature rise that's in the Paris Climate Agreement. And buildings generate about 40% of those emissions. Uh, so the work that you all do in your day-to-day build -day building management really uh, will decide whether we win this fight against climate change. Um, and this year, we've really seen the contrast of what we could have uh, if we make those significant changes. And we had this like great crisp, clean air at the beginning of the pandemic. And then you can compare that to what our future could look like if we really continue down this dangerous path uh, where we had smoke filled skies from the climate fires in Western Washington. And really one of the main things that contributed to the clean air that you see in this picture on the left um, is the huge reduction that we saw in transportation emissions because people at the beginning of the pandemic were really not driving their cars as much. Um, and now there are really, there's so many opportunities for us um, to scale down wasteful consumption in new construction and really improve uh, with smarter building methods. We have retrofit improvements available for existing buildings. And 
now especially there are so many ways here in Seattle that we can commute into work that are either low or no carbon transportation options. And really you see that in kind of the work that has been done with Commute Seattle in the last 10 years. Um, we've really tried to work closely with them as a partner and our building members to reduce drive alone trips. Uh, and you see that kind of in this figure. Um, before the pandemic, this is so this is pre pandemic. So 26% people were driving alone, we were really making significant progress in getting people out of their cars and into those low or no carbon transportation options like transit, biking or walking. Um, it's also teleworking is quite a big chunk of this that will obviously continue to increase um, as the pandemic continues. So why is all of this really so important? Um, well, I mentioned that buildings are about 40% of the emissions here in Seattle. The rest of those emissions, 60% comes from transportation. So if we're gonna meet our climate goals, we really need to continue to reduce our dependency on the car. Uh, and the risk moving forward is that once we start going back to work, once the pandemic really, or once a vaccine comes in, um, that transit capacity is still going to be pretty constrained. So we're all going to feel the need to drive to work. Uh, and for a short period of time, I think that's okay. Like everyone needs to stay safe and feel safe. But as transit capacity becomes uh, more open and built and downtown really starts to reopen, we need to look at these methods of how to get people back out of their cars and into these low or no carbon transportation options. Um, so before I hand it over to Ben, uh, I would just like to take a quick second to thank our sponsors. Um, without these, these companies, it would be really hard for us to do the work that we do uh, and for me to be here talking at this session. Um, particularly this year, uh, with everything that's been going on, their support really keeps us going. Uh, the same goes for our district funders, uh, Boeing, Bullet, and King County. So thank you all to them. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, I look forward to an interesting Q&A panel. Uh, and with that, I will hand it over to Ben. Great, thanks, Matthew. Appreciate um, the introduction to uh, the Seattle 2030 district. And uh, I just wanted to say, uh, coming from the Seattle DOT, we're really thrilled to partner with you and of course with our uh, friends at Commute Seattle. Um, you know, the TMP program is often thought of as uh, congestion mitigation, which it is, but it also is equally um, climate emissions reduction kind of work. So I'm gonna put my screen here. Are we all good, Olivia, with the screen share? You just wanna go into full screen? Yeah. There we go, looks good. Thanks, Ben. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just gonna have a pretty quick uh, five to 10 minute presentation just on some updates uh, from the city side. Um, and then we'll get into our um, information from Team Seattle and a panel discussion. So um, just a few general updates from the city that may be of interest, uh, followed by um, a couple of specific updates that I think some of the property managers on the call today will find more interesting. And, and then finally, just a little bit about CMPs. Um, hopefully folks here are familiar with CMPs and if they're not, I'll kind of give a very quick overview of them and talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in 2021, just given the fact that the world has been upended and travel has been upended. So some general updates, um, unless you've been living under a rock, you probably know the West Seattle high rise bridge um, has been decommissioned um, since March. So we kind of got hit with a double whammy with the pandemic and then with, with this issue. Um, so as of November, uh, November 19th, Mayor Durkin announced that we will be repairing the existing high rise bridge. So that's good news for folks that live off uh, on the peninsula or on the island as some folks call it. Um, we're already working uh, to stabilize the bridge. We've been working on that uh, for a while now, basically since we, we took it offline. Um, and we do anticipate uh, reopening it to traffic come mid 2022. Um, and I will say, you know, that's hopefully, I think, well after uh, we have pretty good overall vaccine distribution. Um, so I think there will be some overlap time in there when folks will, you know, maybe be coming back to the office and be traveling certainly a lot more often and we still won't have this asset. So I think the TDM work that um, folks at SDOT and of course Commute Seattle are doing um, is really important here. I do wanna point out that uh, some folks are probably still using the low bridge, which is, um, you know, uh, 
it, it's a it's a swing, it's a drawbridge, it's lower down uh, near the canal there. Um, the that usage is is, is illegal um, during the daytime hours, and we will be starting with automated enforcement of that um, in January. We've been dealing with COVID as everyone has been, and with the city, there's some kind of unique impacts, unique challenges that I did want to cover. Um, the virus has uh, disproportionately impacted Seattleites. Um, it's not really super surprising that a lot of the negative health impacts that you often see in communities of color and disadvantaged communities around Seattle have also um, been hit harder by the virus um, than other well-off communities. So we're doing our best to figure out how to resource those areas with testing centers um, and with other um, street improvements, especially from the DOT. Uh, changes to how we get around, obviously, as Matthew alluded to, uh, folks aren't traveling as much as they used to right now. Transit is, I think, the big kind of elephant in the room here as to when we can really get back to where we were, given that it's such a workhorse of the system. Um, we've seen more public space needs, and you've seen that probably on uh, sidewalks and maybe even on the cur in, in the curb lane in your neighborhoods with um, kind of reclaiming public space for people as opposed to cars in order to um, meet physical distancing protocols. Uh, local businesses and the economy, I probably don't need to go over that much. I think everyone on here is well aware of, of the recession that we're in right now and, and the long-term impacts there. Um, and then the, at the city side, um, obviously our budget is very much tied to what we bring in uh, through uh, local taxes and things like that. Um, so we've had to tighten up quite a, quite a bit um, and that does include um, a few specific projects at the DOT. Uh, notwithstanding, we've been able to kind of get out there and respond as best as we've uh, been able. Um, you've probably seen plenty of uh, curbside pickup zones for restaurants, try to keep restaurants uh, going during the pandemic. We've um, introduced a lot of signal changes um, in order to make um, streets friendlier to people walking uh, with reduced cycle lengths. That just means you have less time waiting uh, you know, to cross a major street uh, to get a walk sign. Obviously, this is helpful if you're driving too to cross that street, but I think particularly with the pandemic, and uh, people being out on the streets a little bit more and on transit a little bit less. This was an important thing to do. Uh, we've put out Stay Healthy Streets, which are uh, essentially kind of glorified neighborhood greenways in which uh, people can walk and roll um, and kind of use the street however they see fit um, and share it uh, with cars who are uh, limited to local access only. And we've also been processing uh, recovery permits from businesses. These are um, a whole series of free uh, permits that businesses can apply for to occupy the right of way and use it for commerce. Um, in this case, you can see um, a brewery over in Capitol Hill. Um, so we can, we're going to continue this work. Um, the 2020 programs that we have out there, like Stay Healthy Streets and like those permitting options, we've extended them into 2021 until at least October. Um, so you should continue to see that. You'll see on the, the photo here on the right was Halloween this year. We had a special um, Halloween Stay Healthy Street uh, permit availability, I think we'll continue to roll out uh, things like that. Um, we're working on strategies internally that foster recovery that also hit our long-term goals. Climate certainly is among them. Um, Matthew alluded to obviously the major challenges we have there. Um, and also just our overall mobility goals to, to transition to a, a less car-centric uh, transportation system. And, and again, to equity goals, as I alluded to earlier, trying to serve neighborhoods that um, we have underserved in the past. Uh, and then finally, just overall at the city level, um, there's an effort out there, you may or may not have heard of it, called Reimagine Seattle. Um, the mayor has announced uh, $100 million of funding uh, for Black and Indigenous uh, peoples of color communities, BIPOC communities. And we are working uh, with other agency partners on a slew of recovery efforts that um, you should start to see uh, bubble up in the next year or so. Scooters are out there. I'm sure you've probably seen scooter share uh, various uh, vehicles from Lime, you see on the upper, uh, the top picture there, Link, which is on the left, uh, bottom left, and then Wheels, which is a seated scooter option on the bottom right. So as of November, we've got all three operating. Link has, uh, through our permit with them, initially deployed many of their scooters in West Seattle as a uh, mitigation measure for that, for the bridge issue that I mentioned. Uh, we're in the midst of an education campaign, both on social media and otherwise, um, on appropriate scooter parking. Um, we know that obviously it's is and was and will continue to be a concern as to where the devices end up when they're not in use. Um, and really, you know, the benefits don't want to get lost, uh, that scooters can be really useful and maybe for folks who aren't comfortable with bike share for whatever reason, they're not comfortable comfortable on a bicycle. Scooters may be a more comfortable option. They're great for short, short to medium length trips. They're great to connect to transit. And I think even 
you know, post pandemic, um, even when people are back on transit, they'll still be super useful and, and a super important part of your TMP program. We've continued to expand the bike network. Um, I'm gonna focus particularly downtown here. Uh, we installed, you can see in the photo there, um, a portion of the 4th Avenue protected bike lane from Madison up to Bell Street. Um, and we expect to extend it further north and further south. So it'll go eventually from Vine all the way down to Yesler uh, later next year, 2021. And what you're really seeing here is even in just in the last couple of years, a center city bike network that is much more connected um, and much more usable. And I think it's gonna be a super valuable resource uh, for post COVID commuting. And there's been a lot of data out there, certainly anecdotes about electric bike sales going way, way up. Um, and the data from that we have um, really bears this out. And this table is, this is even pre-pandemic. So we don't have the 2020 annual counts up yet, but you can see that at a lot of these locations sort of sprinkled throughout the city, um, some of the major bike facilities, the general trend is that bike volumes are going up. Um, and I think, I suspect that in 2020, we'll see a real spike here um, in bike volumes and hopefully it, it continues. Okay, so a couple of uh, quick updates for property managers. Um, so you may have missed this, but we put out a new director's rule jointly, SDOT and SDCI put out a, a rule regarding um, off-street bicycle parking guidance. So as of today, um, if you construct a building, the municipal code, the SMC, has basic requirements for how much bike parking you need to offer. Um, sometimes with TMPs, we may require you to go over and above that um, as a TMP um, measure. Nonetheless, uh, the requirements didn't really have specific um, dimensions and usage and information about weather protection, et cetera. Um, so when we, uh, when we share these slides out later, the, that hyperlink will be clickable and you can take a look at the new director's rule. Um, this is really applicable mostly for new construction or you know, construction that's going through the permitting. Nonetheless though, I think it could be useful if you're thinking about renovating your bike room and you kind of know what's the late, what want to know like what's the latest um, in indoor bike parking facility design is. This, this information will have it. And then if you need even more, SDOT has a, a more glossy kind of user-friendly document, a bike parking guidelines document with some more information. But the director's rule really does um, provide very specific information about how to meet those requirements in the municipal code. Uh, secondly, we are soon to release, I was hoping it would happen by today, but it, it should happen any day or any week now, uh, a document called the Transportation Electrification Blueprint, um, which will uh, talk about the different pathways we have towards electrifying transportation. Um, so Matthew alluded to the importance of this, um, and buildings are going to play certainly a large part here. Um, and it's going to include a whole bunch of strategies, um, including some pilots that we hope to launch in partnership with Seattle City Light that'll help electrify your parking spaces. And I think as that third bullet here shows, there are definite, there will be definite opportunities for TMP buildings and buildings that are members of District 2030 to really benefit um, from some of these programs um, to get electrification in there. And I wanted to put that item here in bold at the bottom of this slide on. Um, Matthew talked about the importance of uh, overall emissions reduction in, in all the sectors. This blueprint document is gonna have a pretty aggressive goal, um, if I may say so that by 2030, 90%, nine out of 10 trips are zero emission. So that can mean, that doesn't mean they all have to be electric vehicle. Um, in fact, we'd probably prefer it if most of them were shifted over to walk or to bike or to, um, to transit, which, which by 2030 should be electrified um, according to our agency partners. Um, some of the trips obviously that remain that are car trips will need to be electrified, but overall, if you think about it today, three out of 10 trips are basically zero emission to get to nine out of 10 in 2030 is a pretty heavy lift. So we're gonna need kind of an all hands on deck approach um, and that includes um, your help as TMP partners. So I wanted to put up a quick poll. Uh, Olivia, do I need to, all right, there you go. Okay, we've got a quick poll. I just wanted to know kind of if you're interested in hearing more about either of these future topics, uh, sort of the subject matter uh, experts at the city would be happy to to put a webinar out about either of these topics if you're interested. Great, seems like interest in both and in particular the electrification blueprint and opportunities for property managers. So we will, we will definitely note that and um, I think we'll work with Seattle and perhaps Matthew, if you want to work together too, we can 
get something set up um, in the new year about the electrification blueprint. Okay, um, just a couple more quick updates just on the TMP program itself. So um, this is a photo from March and obviously this is not a, a photo that we really wanna glorify. Um, although yes, it, it did result in some cleaner air and some emissions reduction, but we don't want our downtown to to be like this and to end up like this in a long-term state. So we do expect people to come back into downtown. Um, and as a result, yes, TMPs, just to ward off the question, any TMP requirements you have are still in effect. Um, although we understand that obviously things have changed quite a bit. So what we're gonna do um, in partnership with Commute Seattle, uh, you hopefully uh, coordinated with Olivia and her team to submit a program report in the fall. Uh, so, you know, this, these past couple of months, we're gonna look into that data. We're gonna look into current occupancy levels, planned levels of occupancy. We're gonna follow, of course, you know, trends just on vaccinations and we're gonna, you know, monitor traffic volumes in real time to really try to figure out what 2021 holds. We, we totally understand that 2020 brought some significant changes. We're not necessarily gonna hold any, you know, bad, quote unquote, bad performance uh, with an increase in SOV trips against TMP buildings. Um, that said, we still need to work with you all to make sure that the return to office and return to uh, occupancy is done in a sustainable manner. So we are still planning to conduct travel surveys in the fall. That's kind of assuming that we have some level of uh, return to office by then, which we kind of expect we will. Um, and you know, we'll see, and we'll, we're gonna rely on experts uh, like you all and people in the industry to, to give us information and to help us kind of figure that out. Um, I did wanna make it mention that we are internally with SDCI working on a new TMP director's rule. It was last updated uh, five years ago in 2015. A lot has changed, as you can see on the right, um, that's the growth of Uber and Lyft uh, TMC trips over the last, well, three or four years, I guess we done 2019 on there. So, um, you know, the old director's rule did not mention TNCs whatsoever. They didn't mention any dockless bike share or let alone scooter share. Um, they didn't really recognize the fact that TNC trips when it's just uh, one passenger and one driver are, are basically equivalent to an SOV trip in terms of their negative impacts on both climate and congestion. So. We're doing some updates. We're also updating um, based on some, you know, behind the scenes code changes that we've made about how TMPs come up. So this isn't really going to be, this is not going to be super useful for existing TMP holders. It will be useful if you have a building or if you start managing a building that has a new TMP coming online. Uh, but that said, once we do put this out there, the table of elements I think will be very useful to help you kind of see where the city is going in terms of its TDM updates and sort of the state of the industry. So. We'll, we'll get that circulated once it's adopted um, in the next few months. Uh, finally, as I mentioned, TMP buildings, uh, TMP programs will remain in place. Uh, we wanna limit that backslide. This photo came from the DSA website. This is something we, we are looking forward to seeing. We wanna see a vibrant downtown. We wanna see people out there. And if you have any questions at all, Olivia is gonna go through a lot of information next, but to me, Seattle is always available for free consultations. They are a great partner. Uh, we value our partnership with them and we hope you value uh, your ability to, to talk to them really at any time if you have any, any, any concerns about reopening and um, transportation options. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to Olivia. Thank you. Thanks, Ben. Um, I'm gonna talk to you all a little bit about the transportation landscape, but before I get going, um, and for those that may have jumped in late to the call here, my name is Olivia and I'm a senior program manager here at Commute Seattle. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I really appreciate the folks in the room listening and learning today. Um, we've really been navigating this pandemic since March and back in July, we posted uh, an optimistic property manager webinar filled with really, um, really juicy transportation considerations and best practices for um, a phase building reopening. Um, so if you haven't watched that webinar, I, can, uh, I really encourage you to check out our YouTube page with that recording. All of those best practices are still really relevant today as you um, think about sustainable commute options for your tenants in your building reopening. Um, since then though, you may think not a lot has changed as occupancy rates and worksite reopenings have been fairly stagnant, but for Commute Seattle, quite a bit looks different. Um, we're the same great team, just with a brand new website and a fresh look. So if you've not been to commuteseattle.com recently, I really encourage you to visit, download a resource and stay connected to us by joining our monthly newsletter. Um, I just wanted to briefly go over some of the free services that we offer here at Commute Seattle that uh, Ben and Matthew um, so graciously mentioned here today already, but we're really lucky to have a residence 
resident des dedicated residence specialist for orca business sales and so if you don't have a transit pass program for your building or for your business reach out to us we're happy to get you going with that um, we also have a dedicated person on staff for support for the west seattle high-rise bridge closure i myself as a west seattle resident and um but on the detour route and things look different and so if you're going back across the duwamish valley across the bridge we have some options for you and want to talk about what resources and support your workforce really needs um, i encourage you to reach out to us at the email listed here also a core component just of building reopening is going to be education and communication and so if you're interested in a customized uh solution or transportation fair or seminar for your tenants email myself olivia h at commute seattle and we'll discuss what would be good for your building and for your tenants So as Matthew showed earlier in the presentation, we started this year by publishing our center city mode split and how over 275,000 workers commuted to downtown Seattle. And at that point, three out of four, 75% almost were taking commute options rather than driving alone. Um, even before the pandemic, we learned through this study that telework was the fastest growing commute mode and really one that eliminates that trip completely. Um, but it really only accounted for 6% of those commute trips. But now we know it's been supercharged to nearly one in two workers. And so telework is going to be a part of that solution moving forward. Um, and especially if you're looking to achieve your building's drive alone rate, um, tenants teleworking at some capacity one day a week, week or a couple times a month is a really great um, way to, to reach your drive alone rate goal. Um, we really know though, it's, it's not the only solution and telework doesn't work for everyone. You probably remember our sidewalks looking like this, um, crowded sidewalks, transit being packed, and yes, our highways were still congested and local streets were, were still um, backed up and clogged with traffic, especially during those peak commute times. Likewise, our highways really only have room for 65,000 cars at any given moment. Um, and if you make it through on that, on that highway system through that traffic, we only have storage for about 80,000 vehicles in downtown Seattle. That's not nearly enough space for everyone, every 275,000 um, workers that we have coming to downtown, not all of us are able to drive. Um, and before that pandemic in that mode split chart or that pie chart, you saw there that almost 50% of downtown Seattle commuters were using transit to get to work. And right now, over 150,000 trips are made each day on transit for people that really need it for their daily needs. Um, so we know driving may be below average right now to downtown, but as your buildings become more occupied and we really want to avoid gridlock, transit does need to remain the backbone in the workhorse of our system. Um, I'm going to focus in a little bit on light rail here. We have 28 new stations opening up in the next four years. Think about that, 28 new stations that over doubles what we have already in our light rail system, three of which are going to open in the north end of Seattle here in less than a year. So this time next year, we're going to have new light rail stations online. It's really exciting. It's good. The light rail boom that our region is experiencing is really going to revolutionize how people move about the region. I just want to focus in a little bit too on last November. We saw um, a record breaking yes for transit with overwhelmingly 80% of Seattle voters saying yes on a sales tax increase during a pandemic. This really means that Seattle is it's going to get back. We're still in love with transit. We're going to get back to it. We want it to be there for our kids and for when we get back to work and people will get back to it just when they feel safe and ready to do so. And it's really important to remember that we're working really hard to make sure um, uh, public agencies are working really hard to make sure that that system that we had before the pandemic is still in place um, to move people as we get back to work. And so if you've not been on the bus in a while, it looks quite different. Um, and there, people, like I mentioned, are doing a lot to keep riders and our drivers safe to keep that system moving. So masks are required. Capacity is currently limited on board. We procured a boatload of plexiglass to do driver safety partitions. Uh, buses are cleaned and disaffected each day and also air filters have been upgraded. Um, like I mentioned, some routes are still busy. There's a lot of transit riders still out there getting, getting out, um, moving around and still using that system. And so Metro is supplying more buses for those busy routes. So you may see at a bus stop, um, this, the same route arriving um, with two buses at a time, hop on that second bus, it's gonna have more space and more seats available for you all. Also, if you're like me and you used to store your Orca card in your phone or in your wallet, uh, make sure it's in there as you get back to work and, and make sure it's in there so you can have that contact list and, and touch, touch free pay with your Orca card. 
Um, so all in all, it's really critical for transit to be a part of our system. Um, we know it's not the only way to get around, but it does help help us be the great city that we are. And so it's really critical for property managers to help us and to strongly encourage uh, multimodal commutes, but also to help us communicate that transit, transit is really essential to making our city thrive. Um, and remember, Commute Seattle is really here to help you do that effectively. We know, like I mentioned, that transit, you know, isn't a solution for everyone, especially if you're looking um, to go back to work in, in the new year before a vaccine, you may be looking for a socially distanced commute. And I'm going to spend a couple moments talking about a few strategies to think about, especially for, for your building. Um, ben alluded to this a little bit as it pertains to e-bikes, but Bike sales are through the roof. Um, if you've ordered a bike, and most of the bikes that are coming to stock right now are spoken for already. And so as a property manager, I really encourage you to think about how your building can accommodate more bicycles. One parking stall for a vehicle can hold up to about 15 bikes. And so reach out to Commute Seattle, see how you can get some temporary bike racks or staples to be able to accommodate more bikes. Um, also, many more people are riding. Many more people are riding for fun. And so Reach out to your tenants, see if they know what the bike room code is, see if they have an access card or a key card to be able to get in and park their bike in that secure bike parking. Um, you may notice that it rains in Seattle. I don't, I don't think it's raining right now, but um, for a bike commuter or a run, a run commuter or a person that walks to work, keeping those showers and locker room facilities open really ensures that your building has an equitable access for people arriving by all modes. Um, it's really a game changer to be able to store personal items, a change of clothes, shower, shower shoes, what have you, to be able to, to have that start of your day be really fresh and not have to sit at your desk soggy and wet. For those that um, maybe aren't able to, to bike or run or walk to work, there are many still options for you to be able to get around without needing to drive alone. And so I really encourage folks to lean into HOV commuting or high occupancy vehicles, carpool, van pool. Um, consider sharing your ride with one other person. Um, van pool, you can start one right now with just two people in the van instead of five. And so it's a really great time to get a new benefit going, um, especially around a shared vehicle in a shared parking cost and, and sharing that space at the end of the day in the building as well. Um, for building managers or property managers, make sure you're ready and accommodate, ready to accommodate that HOV and carpool and van pool parking. Many of your building commitment and agreements already outline those priority parking spaces and um, priority uh, pricing for those parking stalls as well. Likewise, we hear a lot that I just can't find a ride. I don't, I don't know how to share my ride or I don't, I don't know anybody to, to get downtown or, or to help fill an empty seat. And so I just want to note that Rideshare Online is, is the place to be able to do that. Before the pandemic, we had 600 van pools arriving in downtown Seattle. That's a lot of seats. That's a lot of vans to jump into. Many of these vans are still running today, serving hospitals in First Hill and other essential workers. So reach out to Commute Seattle. We can help query and, and see what vans are running near your building to be able to communicate that out to folks to see where folks can jump in a van so they don't have to start their own. And then briefly, um, can't go without transportation without talking about parking. Um, and I really want to, to, to hone in on this a little bit and help us spread out the peak as your, your building um, tenants return to work, um, not only for crowd control, um, for congestion and such, but also for crowd control in your elevators and internally in your building. Um, really rethink early bird parking and offer uh, a parking price that maybe is at off peak to to encourage folks to travel at 9.30 rather than arrive at the building at 8 a.m. Likewise, daily parking really means daily choices. And for tenants that maybe want to get back to work one day a week um, before the vaccine and they, they just want to be there, uh, monthly parking isn't gonna suit them. It's no longer justifiable. And so help them make that justification by offering a daily choice for them. Finally, um, parking management tools can really help you get an idea, an idea for your demand before people are arriving at your building. And so use a reservation system if you haven't researched those already, Commute Seattle can help you do that and hone in on a good platform for your building. Um, I know some of our property managers here in the room today have some good technology to talk to you about too, but um, knowledge is power and over communication is key, especially right now. So I'll just encourage you to use those really two basic tools as your building reopens and you have more tenants coming back. Um, so really this is just the surface. Commute Seattle has so many tips and strategies that we can help you encourage sustainable commute options. And so I really encourage you to reach out for a free consultation. We're here for you. We're here to learn with you and also to really make an unbiased recommendation for what um, 
what commuting can look like for your building. So without further ado, though, I'm going to toss it back over to Matthew. So a lot of great information there for, from both uh, CommuteCL and SDOT. Um, I'd like to kind of bring in Sabrina and Jim here and just ask a few questions related to the information that we've had and just kind of what you're thinking in your buildings. Um, and to start, I think just as people start to come back to your buildings, uh, what are the measures that you're implementing as a property manager to ensure that people can get back to the building safely uh, and ensure social distancing is maintained throughout that? Sabrina, why don't we start with you? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Um, well, for those of us that have been in any buildings in downtown Seattle, I'm sure we've all seen the um, sanitizer dispensers, signage in the elevators, signage on the doors, um, the CDC recommendations for social distancing. Um, in our elevators, we have requirements. It's two per cab, um, the queuing dots, all, all the things, right, the signage. Um, but in addition to that, all of our buildings, um, some are at a concierge in, in the lobby, but for those that didn't, we've added a security concierge person in the lobby. And so the idea behind that is um, as folks start to come back and we start to see lines um, for folks waiting in the elevator, they can help with queuing um, and let people know when elevators are, are available. Um, so we, we haven't seen a, a backup yet. I personally experienced it at one of the buildings downtown, um, but I, I know there will be an overlap on as folks start to come back to the office versus you know a vaccine and what people are comfortable with as far as being close in proximity to other people. Yeah, thanks. Jim, how about you? Um, well, in addition to you know the very sound things that uh, Sabrina has been doing at, at Clyes, and good morning, everybody. I'm not on the 40th floor today. I'm over in the North Olympic Peninsula, so with the uh, help of virtual meetings, so uh, that's how we roll these days. Um, Columbia Center, you know, 76 stories, a million and a half square feet, 4,400 people uh, coming in and out of the building pre-COVID. Uh, and 14 entrances to the building. One of our uh, things that we looked at was um, uh, kind of uh, keeping, uh, keeping an eye on who was coming in, how they were coming in. And so we had to uh, shut down um, uh, the majority of those entrances so that we could kind of uh, uh, police how people were coming in and out. Uh, of the building and um, and then with the elevators, we have over 48 elevators at Columbia Center and we've been doing, uh, as Sabrina indicated, uh, uh, reminders in every cab and in every elevator lobby of uh, uh, the need to pay attention to capacity in the elevators and then uh, worked with our uh, janitorial service provider to make sure that there were uh, frequent uh, wipe downs and disinfections throughout the day. Thanks. Um, so kind of going back to the, the transportation side of things, um, Olivia just mentioned how transit is, is trying to make things safer, but it's also more constrained right now. As transit capacity um, increases, and obviously SDOT and Commute Seattle are a great resource for everyone on the call to find out when that is happening. Uh, what are your strategies to get people back into transit or kind of more specifically out of their cars? Um, I'll take a stab at that, Matthew. So uh, as Olivia uh, indicated, uh, the importance of knowledge and communication and what we found in, in surveying our tenants, we did a couple of things. So we, we've, we've stayed in touch with them throughout the pandem pandemic uh, to get you know, information uh, to them on what we're doing. Uh, and hear from them on on what they need. Um, oh shoot! Oh, and so communication. So one of the biggest tools that we found, again, for and and I don't know that it's going to be right for every building, but I think it's 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 a technology base that that others are going to look at. Is we have a Columbia Center app, and it's a white box app that we developed with a company called HQO, and we push information out, um, very real-time information 
to all of our tenants, no matter where they're at. And a big part of that app right now is, is communication on, you know, our changes to, to daily parking. We were very constrained at the tower. So we've always, even pre COVID, uh, looked at ways to help our tenants get their employees to work. So uh, this app has transit uh, options. Uh, right now, it's got um, uh, a feature on it that uh, tenants can use to kind of schedule um, uh, people coming into their office. So, you know, that communication, um, that communication technique, that, that tool has been very helpful for us. And I think at my properties, one of the biggest things we'll be taking a look at is the, the bike parking and the bike facilities. Uh, we do have bike cages at all of our properties and um, shower facility, even if that means one shower at, you know, maybe a, a, a mid-rise 11 story building. Um, but I, I think now's the time to really take a good look at capital projects and, and expanding that because even pre-COVID, the bike cages were pretty full. So that'll be a good one to investigate over the next few months. Yeah, that actually leads me perfectly into my next question. So uh, Olivia mentioned kind of changing up parking strategies uh, and the fact that one parking space can hold 15 bikes. Uh, are there things that you're doing as an organization to kind of rethink your parking strategies as people start to come back to buildings? Um, sorry, I, I don't know if you I had a little, a little one distract me in the background. I thought she was coming in to answer the question. I thought so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm like, well, let me, and her name's Olivia too. Let Olivia come answer. Yeah. Um, well, one thought, one, um, just a realistic, I, I wanted, I, I'm very interested to see how you fit 15 bikes into one stall because too. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I have not been able to do that and have people be able to get in and out. Um, so if you could show me how to engineer that, that'd be great. Um, you know, I'm um, at our properties, we have attached parking garages and we have both, you know, monthly parking available and daily parking. Uh, one, another thing that came up in Olivia's presentation is thinking about trying to encourage folks to come at different times. And I'm even asking myself that question as I sit here right now, how do we do that? Because we have the super early bird rates to try to encourage people to come at six or seven. Um, but uh, I will be working closely with our uh, parking garage management firm to come up with strategies because I like that. I, the idea of trying to encourage um, different time frames for folks coming in and not penalize them because they're coming at a different time. One of the things that we had looked at too in relation to, to bikes, Matthew, is that um, again, kind of a, a self-serving um, um, position is we invested in a, we found space inside the building. So consider that if, if you will, the design of Columbia Center is probably 40 years old and, and uh, bikes were something that kids did in the neighborhood back in the early eighties, right? And uh, so, you know, let's come into 2015, 2016, and uh, we identified an area, uh, underutilized area, storage areas um, on uh, one of our six levels of, of uh, uh, underground parking that uh, we invested in a, in a very secure bike storage room, uh, access card controls. And then even building on that, we've added, uh, I think, upwards of 20 uh, bike lockers, uh, you know, with some of the investments our employees have in their bikes, they, they were asking for those lockers. It, it's probably going to be tough. I'm kind of like Sabrina, I'd, I'd love to see how to get um, more bikes into a space and, and, you know, we'll remain flexible post pandemic to see see what this means for our employees as far as you know we hear in their in their in our surveys with them that safety on uh, our in mass transit is one of their big concerns uh, but to get back to the bikes are we're, we're lucky that we have an ownership that is open to ideas and flexible so I think we keep building on that um, you know the head scratcher for us would be 
our, our, our parking is probably one quarter of, uh, of what other buildings are in downtown Seattle. So right now over 5% of my parking is already um, uh, ride share, ride share carpools. Then I have my uh, electric vehicle spots and my uh, uh, zip cars. So to start pulling uh, spaces out for more biking is is going to be a challenge, but um, uh, that's what we do at the Columbia Center. We sometimes you just got to figure out a way, but we're we're lucky that we have got a pretty good capacity right now. Jim, yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, you know the the concern as folks come back. You know a lot of people have fear of riding transit, right? Um, so that's another. And I'm really glad that there's folks on today that we're able to hear Ben and Olivia's presentation and learn what transit's doing, what Metro's doing, how they're making it safer. So I think as property managers, um, we have a <clears throat> we have a responsibility and an opportunity to with our tenants and let them know what to expect and, and yeah. help alleviate some of those concerns as they consider returning to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Jim, I think it's it's interesting that the challenges that you have are also pretty much the reason why you won the Transportation Vision Award, right? It's, it's like you're a leader in these things. And I think the Columbia Center was, was one of the first uh, large developments to really reduce the amount of parking that they had in a building. So um, there was less than kind of what the average was at the time. Um, so kind of interesting to hear how those things have, have now become sort of challenges. Um, Olivia, I think the challenge is being laid down for you to show a graphic or some sort of how you fit five, 15 bytes into a parking spot. Um, <laughs> ben, I have a, a, a quick question for you. I think uh, a lot of people on the call probably have to deal with TMP surveys or CTR surveys. Um, and the changes that you mentioned about um, ride share um, and scooters is there going to be a change in the survey questions to reflect the different modes of transportation that are now available? Uh, yeah, and Olivia might be able to build off this answer. I believe, yes, um, we're certainly working with the state. So the CTR survey tool is run by the state, so we don't have perfect control over it. And typically TMP buildings, um, as many folks here may know, they use the same tool um, just because we make it available to them and it's free and it's easy to use. Um, so we're working with the state to kind of actually reimagine that tool. Um, and I think it may be kind of ready, uh, or some version of the tool may be ready for, for next survey cycle. Uh, but the, the long answer is so yes, um, we did this past survey round kind of recommend that folks, if they took a TNC um, and they were the only person in that TNC to market as such, um, even though it's not perfect. Maybe not the greatest answer, but we are we are trying to evolve <laughs> that reporting. Matthew, I think your question is like, will Uber and Lyft or employer shuttles maybe be on the new survey? And I think the short answer is yes. Um, Washa has heard us like loud and clear that we're we're not capturing a lot of information by those modes not being on there. Um, and so, for me personally, for a person that administers a survey for five hundred different buildings and businesses around Seattle. It's going to be huge. It's going to be a, a way different picture and we're going to learn a lot from it. So it's really exciting. And I encourage you to reach out to me and ask me about your survey if you haven't. Um, we have a lot of information for property managers and are happy to help digest what that mode split and what that survey looks like for you all too. I really appreciate you all joining us and, and learning from us and participating in today's webinar. And really want to thank Jim and Sabrina, Matthew and Ben for joining us here today, um, coming in the room with their ideas and really helping us make um, this event great and, and virtual and available to you all um, for this year too. Thanks everyone. Thanks Olivia. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone. Appreciate your Thank time. You, we'll see you soon. Take care.